Hi all, I'm Leanne Wood, I'm from the Law Foundation, nice to see you here. And this is of course the residential tenancy update for you, so if you're in the wrong room, now's the time. Um, I'm, uh, we are grateful to have our three speakers here with us today. Uh, we have Amber Prince on my right, she's from Tira, Danielle Sabelli from CLASS, and Zuzanna Modrovic from TRAC. Um, they are happy to take questions as we go. Um, so I can run out to you with the mic if you need some amplification. Um, and with that, I'll turn over the uh, mic to our guest. Thank you. Okay, so my portion of this is going to be a little bit dry. So I'm going to be talking about uh, legislative updates and updates in the policy guidelines in the last year. So since the last conference. So the first and only change to the Residential Tenancy Act since I was here doing this update last year was um, this section about cannabis. So because, as you know, cannabis has been legalized and now there's a piece of legislation specifically dealing with cannabis, uh, the RTA put the section in there so that people can understand what the rights and responsibilities are when it comes to smoking and growing pot. So essentially, this is enforced as of October 17th of last year, so basically right after this conference last year, uh, which was the day that Section 14 of the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act came into the force. So any tenancy that was started before October 17th, 2018, is now deemed to have a no smoking of cannabis clause if it already has a no smoking clause and does not have a term that permits smoking cannabis explicitly. Uh, and smoking does not include vaping, so that's good to know. Any tenancy agreement entered into before October 17th, 2018 is also deemed to have a no-grow clause unless the tenant was already growing cannabis before that date and the tenant's in compliance with any sort of applicable legal requirements regarding the growing of medical cannabis. Are you seeing these faces? Have you seen them? I have not. So, the next thing I want to talk about was sort of the biggest policy update uh, in the last year. For those of you who do residential tenancy stuff regularly, you probably know about this. So policy guideline two was the previous policy guideline and it was in place up until July of this year. And it was replaced by policy guidelines 2A and 2B. I should probably turn my pages as I go. <laughs> So policy guideline 2A deals with two month notices to end tenancy. So those are the ones that are for landlord use of property. So if a landlord or a close family member wants to move into the unit um, or a purchaser wants to move into the unit after the, all the conditions for the sale have been met. And 2B deals with what we've come to know as rent evictions and demo evictions and that kind of thing. Also conversions in use. So I'm going to take you through essentially mostly most of what these policy guidelines have to say because most of it is different from what the old policy guideline two said. Um, starting with the good faith requirement. So the good faith requirement means that a landlord who issues a two month notice in this case has to have a good faith intent to do what the notice says. So on the notice landlord has to indicate I'm issuing this notice because I want to move it, or because I or a close family member wants to move into the unit, or I'm issuing it because a purchaser wants to move into the unit, et cetera. Um, the landlord has to not have any intent to defraud or deceive, and the landlord has to not have any alter ulterior mo motive. And the landlord can't be trying to avoid any obligations under the Residential Tenancy Act. So. If, a, if I suppose if you have a case where uh, property is sort of very run down, tenant gets a repair order from the RTB and then the landlord turns around and issues a two month notice for landlord use of property, I think you can make a reasonable case that the landlord is trying to avoid their obligations under the RTA to repair and maintain. Um, so most of this is largely unchanged from the last policy guideline. I would sort of point out a couple subtle differences. Uh, the old policy guideline used to list examples of evidence that the landlord should provide to show that they're acting in good faith. For some reason, they've chosen in this policy guideline, in this version, to put in examples of 
evidence that tenants can put in to show the landlord is acting in bad faith. And I wonder if that signaling some kind of an expectation from arbitrators that tenants actually have to provide evidence now that a landlord's acting in bad faith. I haven't seen that happen yet, but maybe, maybe it will. And but the onus is on the landlord, by the way. Yes. Sorry, uh, do you mean does the rent increase, the control, the rent control apply to new tenancies? Uh, no, they don't. So essentially where, where there's a new tenancy uh, with a new tenant, brand new tenant moving in, um, a landlord and tenant can uh, agree on any amount for rent. Okay. So another new thing about this, um, it now specifies that a landlord uh, has to plan to occupy the unit or, or the purchaser has to plan to occupy the unit for at least six months. Uh, the old policy guideline did not specify time. So I think they've just taken this straight from the section 51, which is a section on compensation where a landlord fails to do what they said they were gonna do. Okay. So occupying the rental unit. This policy guideline actually defines what occupying the rental unit means, which is nice because the old one didn't. Um, so it means using the rental unit as a living accommodation. And it absolutely does not mean leaving the unit empty, um, except in extenuating circumstances, question mark. <laughs> I'm not sure what they mean by that, but we shall see. So it also states that the landlord has, or whoever moves in, must live there for at least six months, which again, they've taken straight from section 51, subsection two. And it, this can, it can include a landlord who already sort of lives on the property and just wants to expand their living space. So if you have like a landlord who lives in the upstairs of a house and is renting out the basement, the landlord decides that they want to also take the basement as part of their living space, they can issue this kind of notice. And the policy guideline specifies that. One thing it doesn't say um, is w whether a landlord can issue a notice like this and then only live in the unit part time. So that, I think that will be an interesting question um, that we're gonna see at some point. Yeah. Do you know, is there any mechanism like enshrined in the policies that for the tenant to be financially independent, they have to be living in the unit? Because what I've found is that the tenant has to kind of look to see if the name has changed and there's not really a standard way for them to figure that out. Yeah, that's the hardest part of uh, tenants trying to make sort of a claim for a 12 month rent back um, where they they think that a landlord hasn't done what they said they were going to do is that they have to provide evidence because the burden for that is on the tenant. They're the ones that are applying for a monetary order. And there's no easy answer to that. I think sort of the most obvious ones will be where uh, the tenant can show Craigslist ads or something that show that the unit was put up for rent sort of directly after the tenancy ended. Um, the other thing I should say is for those of you not familiar with the new legislation um, is that it also adds uh, escape hatch for the landlord. So section 51 subsection 3 says that a landlord can be excused from paying the penalty in extenuating circumstances and there's nowhere that really defines what that means. Um, so I had, I had a case recently where uh, we were going for 12 months compensation. We had Craigslist ad ads, et cetera. The landlord comes to the hearing and says, oh, there's this closet that uh, wasn't, I couldn't, didn't use it before, but now I'm using it and I have, I have boxes in it. So I've, I've, uh, I've, I've, I'm occupying the rental unit. Um, the, we ended up winning it because I was able to show that the tenant couldn't access that closet because there was a stackable washing machine in front of it. So they were saying that there's a storage space of like three by five feet behind the stackable washing machine. They were saying this is part of the rental unit. I now have boxes in there and I'm using it. So therefore I, I've, um, you know, done the intended thing. Um, the arbitrator indicated that his decision would turn on whether or not he, he thought the tenant could access that space previously, which <laughs> uh, we were able to show that she couldn't, but it makes me worried because, you know, is that an acceptable use of the rental unit, of occupying the rental unit? Does that satisfy the requirements of Section 49? 
I would say it shouldn't. <laughs> With the new policy guideline, uh, it specifies you, that occupying means using the rental unit as living accommodation, and there is no world in which it's reasonable to say that includes just stacking a few boxes in a closet, I think. Uh, so the six months thing, is it they have to be living in there six months, or they have up to six months to prove that they've you know, moved in the parent or whatnot? They have to occupy it for at least six months. Okay. Nothing else? Okay. Oh. I see one more question. I have a question about service uh, in the situation where the, the current landlord issued the uh, notice at the request of a purchaser. Um, I have a case right now where the original landlord was a really good landlord and it was the purchaser who blatantly advertise the unit after kicking the person out. Um, I've looked at the decision base and I see a mixture of whether one la landlord was served or both. Um, we have filed against the actual purchaser who is the bad party. Um, I can amend to include the current landlord if we need to, but we'd kind of like that person as a witness too. I mean, if you're sure that it was the purchaser and you can prove it, um, or you don't, yeah, and you can prove it, then that's probably fine. I should add that you probably can't amend to add a party um, without permission from, you'd have to do it at the hearing. Like, there's no way to amend to add a party. Okay, thank you. Okay, so consequences for not using the property for stated purpose. I, we just covered this, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, essentially, the policy guideline just reiterates what the legislation already says. Sorry to interrupt you. Testing? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to speak to what, what was just mentioned earlier regarding the uh, landlord and then the new purchasers. I just had a successful monetary order with an, a near identical situation. The uh, the owners were great people. The purchasers posted it on Airbnb, and once we printed off those ads and went to the hearing itself, it you know we compiled the evidence package. The arbitrator was just quick to just say, okay, well, yeah, like they didn't buy it. like the previous landlords. They don't have, in, in that arbitrator's opinion, they didn't have the onus of good faith, uh, whereas these new ones did because it's being served on behalf of the new owners. Um, so that. Yeah, it was really smooth. At no point did we have any concerns about the previous owners, but subjective, I guess. Yeah, well, I think the one one tripping point there is what happens if the purchaser says, I never asked the old landlord to do that. Um, if you have the old landlord as a witness, then you can probably overcome that just that way. All right, on to 2B. So this is the one that deals with four-month notices for renovations, demolitions, and conversions in use. And it's changed quite a bit from what the old one was. Um, so the first part I want to talk about is what it has to say about permits and approvals required by law. Um, for those of you familiar with this, prior to the change, the landlord had to have any and all permits that were required to do the work the landlord said they're planning to do. That's essentially true still, but not, not entirely. Um, now the landlord has to have the, the, any permits or approvals required by law that cover an extent of the nature of the work that objectively requires vacancy. So essentially, the landlord wants to do, I don't know, 10 different things that all require permits, and they have permits for nine of them, if an arbitrator thinks that those nine things on their own would require vacancy, they can uphold the notice. I think that's what this is gonna mean. Um, it's still relatively new, so I'm not entirely sure how they're gonna apply it, but that seems to be what it says. Um, if a permit can't be obtained because it, other conditions have to be met, the landlord should provide evidence of policy or procedure that establishes those conditions, and if a landlord takes the position that they don't need permits for the work, they have to provide evidence of that. So the, the policy guideline actually says must in this instance, which is good, because uh, the old one did not. And permits and approvals required by law can require things like zoning changes if that's what's required to do the work, or to convert the use, I guess. 
All right, 2B also has a good faith requirement. So similar to 2A, uh, landlord who issues a notice, a four month notice under section 949.6 uh, has to actually intend to do what they say on the notice they're going to do. Um, and it's again, honest intention with no ulterior motive and they can't be trying to avoid any obligations under the RTA. Uh, so ulterior motive, but what is that? If a landlord's intent, and this is straight from the policy guideline, if a landlord's intent is to re-rent the unit for higher rent without carrying out renovations or repairs, um, that could be bad faith. So again, just like in 2A, the, they've chosen now to include examples of evidence that tenants can provide to show that a uh, landlord is acting in bad faith, which I, I again wonder why that choice is the one they made. Uh, because, as they say, the onus should be on the landlord. Okay, demolition. Uh, demolition is one of the things that a landlord can issue this kind of notice for. Uh, the old policy guideline didn't say anything about what demolition means. Uh, this one does. So this one tells us that demolition means the complete and irreversible destruction of the rental unit, uh, which is good. Uh, that should be what demolition means. It may involve partial destruction of a building so that the, just the unit itself doesn't exist anymore. And if a landlord successfully evicts for demolition, there is no right of first refusal because there's no more unit. All right, renovations uh, or repairs that require the vacancy, that require vacancy. So this is where like much of the substantive changes so for those of you who did the stuff before, uh, you may be used to making an argument that essentially it goes, the tenant is willing to move out temporarily and move back in. Therefore, the tenancy does not need to be ended. And that was essentially what the old policy guideline said. Old policy guideline said, if the tenant is willing to move out during the renovations to accommodate them, the tenancy doesn't need to end. This one, not so much. And I think Danielle will tell us why a little bit later. <laughs> Um, so essentially this one says that, it, it's hard to know, I, I don't even really understand it. So I think the gist is if the renovations or repairs will take long enough, then a tenant's willingness to move, on, move out and move back in is no longer relevant. But it's not super clear what that period of time is that we can't go over. Also in this policy guideline is an appendix, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> appendix A uh, has a list of individual renovations and repairs, and also tells you the likelihood that each of those will require vacancy. It's not super clear what will happen where a landlord wants to do a number of those renovations on that list, but I think in those instances, that opens the door to a staging argument where you can just say, well, maybe if the landlord did all of this at once, it would require the end of the tenancy, it would require vacancy, but the landlord doesn't have to do it all at once. Landlord can do it in stages. The landlord can first do the repiping and then they can do the floors and then they can rip out the, I don't know, something and put it back in. And each of those things doesn't require vacancy. So if they do them one at a time, they shouldn't require vacancy. I think that's the argument that you could make. It also now explicitly says that cosmetic renovations uh, that cause an intermittent disruption in services don't usually require vacancy, which is nice. Uh, before this, the policy guideline too wasn't terribly specific about that. And I remember quite a few cases where, you know, landlords would be just like painting the walls and changing some plugs and maybe ripping out a sink and putting a new one in and then issue this kind of notice. And then you'd have to argue that that's not enough without having sort of anything to really point to. All right, next policy guideline. And I better pick up my pace a little bit. Okay, so next policy guideline I want to talk about is 51. And it is the policy guideline about expedited hearings. And this is a brand new policy guideline. Um, this process did not exist before this policy guideline came into place. So. The RTB can now schedule an expedited hearing uh, where it generally would be unfair for the applicant to wait the normal amount of time. Uh, the normal amount of time would be a minimum of 22 days, although it's never that short. Uh, normally when you apply for dispute resolution, you wait at least, I think, 
six weeks for the urgenter ones, but now um, certain types of cases can be heard faster. Uh, it can be as fast as 12 days uh, after the application is made, and in extreme circumstances, six days after the application is made, in theory. I'm not sure this is actually happening. So the circumstances in which this can be done is any applications under section 33, which is a tenant's application for emergency repairs, section 54, which is a tenant's application for an order of possession, and section 56, which is a landlord's application for an early end to tenancy. Uh, this is just a list of what emergency repairs are. Uh, this is in the act. It's important, I think, to note that emergency repairs are limited to what's listed in the act. Orders of possession for the tenant. So this is where a tenant's been illegally locked out or a tenant has entered into a tenancy agreement with a landlord and the landlord then subsequently just didn't hand over the keys, didn't just refuse to provide the tenant access. So this, these are the situations you might want to use this kind of application for. Tenant might have to prove that a tenancy agreement exists. So if there isn't one in writing, I think there, be, there might be a challenge sort of establishing that. Uh, I think if a tenant sort of fails to prove that a tenancy exists in this process, they can still try a regular length hearing, but I'm not entirely sure how that, that will work. Early end to tenancy, so this is a landlord application under section 56. It's for very serious breaches only. This section's existed for a very long time, but landlords rarely used it, mostly because it didn't make sense to use it, um, because by the time they got around to a hearing, they could have just issued a one month notice and it would have taken effect. So uh, now with the shorter wait period for this kind of hearing, you might see landlords try to use these more. We will see. Okay, so serving documents. So this, there's a standing order uh, about how to serve documents in these kinds of hearings. So um, the methods are, so if the hearing scheduled six to 11 days after the application is made, then it has to be served in person. In person can include leaving it with a person who apparently resides with the tenant or leaving it with an agent of the landlord. Um, it, it specifies where you're leaving it with a person who apparently resides with the person, it specifies that that can only be done if it's a tenant for some reason, even though the act doesn't do that. Uh, it, yeah, so that's something to note. Uh, if the hearing scheduled 12 to 16 days after the application is made, uh, you can serve documents in person or by attaching to the door or other conspicuous place. I would note that notices of hearing normally can't be served by attaching to a door or other conspicuous place. But I think what this means is that these kinds of notices of hearing can be. Um, so that's another thing to note. Uh, because in the RTA it specifies that these are the ways to serve these special documents and also any other way that the director orders. Well, this is an order. So I think that this sort of adds another way of serving this kind of notice of hearing. Okay, so any hearing scheduled 17 or more days after the application is made, you can serve in person by attaching to the door or other conspicuous place or by registered mail. Where you are the applicant and you are serving the notice of hearing, you got to also fill out RTB Form 9, which is the proof of service of an expedited hearing notice. And I think I'm at the end of my portion. So these are the other policy guidelines that have been updated in the last year, and most of this isn't particularly interesting. I'll just real quickly summarize what they've done. So in policy guideline 27, They've added a section on roommates to make it extra clear that they don't want to take jurisdiction over roommates anymore, even though they've already got this in a different policy guideline. Um, policy guideline 30, uh, this is the one on fixed term tenancies. They've clarified some of the information regarding vacate clauses. And 32, they've updated the language to reflect the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. So I think where before they were referring to a marijuana cigarette, <laughs> they no longer do that. Um, so policy guideline 39, they added some clarifying content regarding scheduling where a landlord issues multiple 10 day notices. In 42, they've added restricted file types for evidence. In 47, they added a reference to the recording of information line calls because they do that now, for those of you who don't know. They now record information line calls, but not hearings yet. We, that's still sort of 
in the works, I think. <laughs> Policy guideline 50, compensation for ending a tenancy. They've added a new paragraph, again, on vacate clauses uh, that clarifies that where there is a valid vacate clause in a tenancy agreement, there is no notice or compensation or minimum occupancy requirement. And that's that. Uh, so my update should be pretty quick. I'm happy to, if there's any questions or comments arising out of it, let me know. But um, the things that I wanted to talk about was just, there's a new guideline that's been put out by the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, um, specifically for landlords. Is anyone aware of that, just by show of hands? Have you heard about it, seen it? Some of you. Okay, so it's probably useful to talk a little bit about then. Um, and then there's a case that, I mean, kind of covers a little bit of an information and privacy issue and some other issues. Um, SA versus Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation. Um, this was a tenancy case that arose in BC um, that I began as an advocate and um, worked with another lawyer up until the BC Court of Appeal level. And then it went on to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and there were some pretty important principles that arose out of that and that um, talked about issues that I think are something that we see in our work quite a bit. Um, and then I've got also a housing co-op case. I'm not sure, how many, do you see co-op housing cases just by show of hands? So a few of you. And I know that it can sometimes be tricky to, to one, to navigate those issues. How many are you actually assisting on co-op housing? Just a, just a couple of you? Yeah, wow. Um, but, but it sounds like more of you are seeing it in your work and then, um, so it does come up a little bit. Okay. Okay, so this Office of the Information and Privacy Report, um, it's available on the OIPC's website. Um, that's the link to it there. And it's called Always, Sometimes, or Never, Personal Information and Tenancy Screening. It came out last year and I think I just stumbled on it, which is why I thought that maybe we should talk about it as an update. Because um, I do think it is helpful if you're uh, supporting tenants in, in finding housing or if tenants are coming to you and they're saying, look, the landlord's asking me for X, Y, and Z, are they allowed to do that? Um, and basically the OIPC at, at the beginning of its report, and it was authored by Drew MacArthur, who is the Acting Information and Privacy Commissioner at the time. Um, this report was, came as a result of that office receiving calls, quite a few calls from individuals who'd been asked by potential landlords for all kinds of information, um, including medical information, bank statements, T4 slips. Um, and I think it's helpful that the commissioner acknowledged the fact that lower vacancy rates in Victoria and Vancouver especially, but I know that I've, I've heard that there's also um, some increasing pressure on some of the smaller communities as well, so I acknowledge that. Um, and in any event, that there's a significant power imbalance between landlords and tenants, just given the nature of that relationship. And so that's something, you know, that that office was alive to in thinking about how information and privacy uh, should work between landlords and tenants. So, um, so I, I kind of like how this report talks about things that are always something that can be disclosed to a landlord, some things that are kind of in that gray area or maybe sometimes, and then, and then things that would never be, that a landlord should never be asking for. So hopefully that's helpful to you in guiding your own work. Um, just in terms of examples of things that landlords are always authorized to collect. So information that clearly relates to and is reasonable for the purpose of assessing the tenant. So references and contact information would be examples of uh, information that's always appropriate. Um, interesting, I actually didn't know this till I read this report, consent's not required to collect personal information that's publicly available. However, landlords are supposed to notify tenants that they've relied on that information. So information that can sometimes be collected it might be um, a tenant's age. Again, depending, is that relevant? Is it, is it for the purpose of um, something that's relevant to that potential tenancy? Proof of income or employment, that's gonna 
that's again going to depend on the circumstances and credit history. Um, so again, the OIPC is saying it really depends on the context and whether that information um, could be collected in a different way without violating so much of someone's privacy. Um, so the example that the examples that are given in the report are if if the tenancy is housing for people who are 55 plus, then obviously age is going to be relevant. It's not going to be relevant in a different circumstance. Um, credit checks can are something that a landlord can rely on, but only if they're unable to get um, satisfactory references or employment or income verification elsewhere. And then information that can almost never be collected, um, whether the tenant is a smoker, which is kind of interesting after talking about policy guidelines about um, smoking. Um, and information collected from internet searches and social media platforms. I guess that would be like going on, trying to get someone's information from Facebook. Is there a question? Yeah, I have yeah. a question regarding, can you hear me? Um, criminal record checks. It's my understanding that within the last year, the, um, the rules on that have changed as well, where it's now actually allowed under the Human Rights and Privacy Act. I'm pretty sure that this report says you shouldn't be getting criminal okay, record checks. Um, the wording changed this year when it was um, when it was released, and it actually the wording was changed to that it was acceptable to ask for a criminal record check. Um, from this report, which has kind of a chart that talks about always authorized, sometimes authorized. Um, so it's saying always authorized is consent consent for a criminal record check. Also, this report arises because there's systemic issues around the type of information that's being collected and how it's used. Um, I'm hoping that by just kind of flagging this report that it can be utilized by advocates in cases you're seeing to kind of point to and say, well, you know, you've got, you've got one government body over here saying that this isn't appropriate in certain circumstances. And if, you know, if it doesn't meet the circumstances that the OIPC sets out as, of when it's reasonable. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, I don't know whether you can really force the RTB to, to you know, to, to um, you know, adhere to the, to the guidance that another government office provides. But it should at the very least be persuasive. And I think the fact that this report was developed specifically recognizing that there is a systemic problem around information and privacy and tenancy. And again, I like that this commissioner has highlighted the fact that there is a power imbalance, that there is a, a housing crisis that we're in, and that those things are relevant to the vulnerability of tenants and prospective tenants that should be um, you know, considered and hopefully is going to be considered by the RTB more so going forward. Information about employment. Um, I think it's a human rights code violation to discriminate uh, tenancy based on lawful uh, income. Isn't that, it just strikes me as a way to get around that and still uh, discriminate based on lawful income, that being income assistance. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question because um, when I go back to that, I don't know, yeah, I was, I was kind of curious about in what context. Again, it has to be relevant, and I, I there wasn't a, an example there of how it would be relevant or appropriate to ask. And then, in, and then on the next couple paragraphs in the report, it says you can't ask stuff that's protected under the Human Rights Code. So, yeah, and your source of income is is a protected ground under the Human Rights Code. So. Whether, whether your income is derived from income assistance or disability assistance is not a basis on which a landlord can deny you tenancy. So, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. In, in respect to the you know, rights code, and look, this happened years ago. I had one of my clients come in and say, my boyfriend wants to move in with me, but the landlord wants him to do a background check she says he looks creepy. And I said, well, that doesn't sound right. 
uh, that, that sounds like more discrimination uh, because he has a glass eye, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would say that's discrimination, and I think um, you're you're flagging something important to again around that line between what's what's reasonable and relevant, and then also what's just you're just discriminating against someone now. Um, you can't you can't um, you can't be asking questions or or um, taking steps that are going to violate the human rights code, and that's potentially discrimination. It could be discrimination based on disability. Could be, could be any number of things. So I think it's, it makes sense to be challenging um, landlords when you can about the information that they're collecting and why they're collecting it. At the same time, I also I know that there's a real reality as well about you know people people trying to stay housed and uh, or or trying to get housing secure housing at all and then. Um, the best way of going, how to, what's the best way of going about that in terms of the strategies you use, so. Yeah, well, and I think, I mean, this is a pretty big report. I'm not sure, I mean, it's quite a few pages, so it's probably good to, to really dig in. I mean, I'm providing a very surface, kind of just letting you know it exists and giving some very basic highlights, but I would have a, a look into it to see if there's anything there that you can utilize to, I mean, one, it can't be a human rights violation, and this report itself is saying, like, you can't ask people questions that, uh, that relate to a protected ground under the human rights code. So if you think, if, you know, if it doesn't really pass the smell test, there's, you know, there's some, something there that you, doesn't feel right, I would definitely give some consideration to that. But I'd also look at the report in a deeper way to see if there's something in there that's useful to you. The, the, our, the Residents and Tenancy Act has to abide by PIPA or FIPA. That's what reigns supreme is the privacy law. So if there is a uh, um, two, if, if there is, if you have the RTB decision and you do have something, then you should be able to make a privacy complaint. The privacy commissioner consent can make orders uh, and that would include against the RTB. So you should be able to not win your case, but at least send a message to the RTB that they, they may have the interpretation wrong. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I mean, your client uh, definitely has a right to bring a complaint against a public body if, you know, there's an information and privacy concern that's going on. They have the right to bring that to the OIPC if that's something that they want to do. That's something that... Well, you have one year to bring a, an OIPC complaint, so... If a client's interested, it might be, might be something worth uh, pursuing. It's a definitely an option to consider. Did either of you have any, anything to add to any of this discussion? No? No, it's still... I know, I feel, I feel like all of us have to like, take a closer look at it as situations arise. Yeah and hopefully, hopefully utilize it for the better, <laughs> not <laughs> as much as we can. Um, so the other thing that I just wanted to flag for this report is this report also talks about nonprofit housing providers, because sometimes we have concerns about nonprofit housing providers as well. Um, and I say that working, as a, working at an organization that is a nonprofit that provides housing. Um, the, so, the report talks about how you can't compl you can't apply everything to to landlords generally to the nonprofit housing sector because sometimes for the purpose of for example subsidized rent you know there's going to be a little bit of a different analysis going on there in terms of what information is appropriate to collect for for tenants um, but I think it's important and I underline this and this is something that the report speaks to in a few different places. Organizations are still limited to collecting only personal information that is reasonable in the circumstances. So if you think that a nonprofit housing provider in, for example, their rent calculation guide, um, in income verification, is just asking for more information that is reasonably necessary to establish that that person has a right to subsidized housing, then don't don't be afraid to, to query that further to you know with your clients instructions to challenge those things 
which leads me to SA and Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation, because this is a case that was exactly that. This was a case where the client um, had a discretionary trust established. Um, she was someone, she was a person with disabilities who had um, disability, provincial disability benefits, and she was filling out her regular form that you have to fill out for subsidized housing um, to determine her eligibility. And the landlord wanted to know how much was in this discretionary trust. And as many of you will know, if you, if you also are dealing with income assistance, discretionary trusts are treated as an exempt asset by um, the, the ministry. And in my work, up until I ran into Metro Vancouver Housing, or MVHC, um, most landlords were treating discretionary trusts as sort of this exempt asset or something that they weren't concerning themselves with. Um, for those of you familiar with BC Housing, BC Housing has a, you know, a, a rental assistance guide for nonprofit housing providers, for example, that, you know, also sets out, you know, there's these, these exceptions and we're, we're, you know, as government entities, we're not treating discretionary trusts as assets. Well, MVHC decided that it, it could, it was its own body and it could do what it wanted and it could create its own policies and it could have, uh, it could decide that a discretionary trust was an asset. Um, and originally, the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner agreed with the landlord and the lower courts agreed with the landlord um, and the matter, you know, ended up at the Supreme Court of Canada where Thankfully, the, the Supreme Court of Canada finally said no. No one else treats a discretionary trust as an asset. It's, in terms of how um, a discretionary trust actually works, it's, it's not even truly an asset because you know, someone doesn't have a right to just demand that money, so you can't treat it that way. Um, so the fact that she didn't have an actual entitlement meant that the the housing provider could not treat it as an asset and that could not, they couldn't ask for more information about something that wasn't her asset and her not providing that information did not mean she was disqualified from being considered for a rent subsidy. So they had to consider her for a rent subsidy and not have that information. So it's just sort of an example of why, why you might want to challenge landlords requesting information. I mean, this case is kind of extreme in the <laughs> extent that it went, and hopefully having this precedent is helpful in, in seeing other landlords um, maybe not, not picking this fight, but, uh, but we'll see. And then the last case I wanted to talk about was um, Potter and Vancouver East uh, Cooperative Housing Association. Um, again, I know most of you aren't, your day-to-day -day isn't co-op housing, but um, I think this is an issue that probably does come up um, when you are dealing with co-op housing, which is when someone's underhoused or overhoused. Um, and in this case, co-op members brought an action against the co-op, and there's a section under the Cooperative Association Act which allows members to, to bring an action against co-op um, for oppressive or unfair actions. and. Um, in this case, the members were saying, look, you're allowing long-term co-op members to stay overhoused. So maybe they had kids that had grown up and they're no longer in the house. Um, and they were allowed to keep for like a, like say a two bedroom unit when they're, when they're one person and they weren't very quick to make those, those folks move on. At the, at the same time, you had people who were underhoused, so people who didn't have enough um, bedrooms who were just waiting and kind of languishing on the on the wait list um, and the court ended up deciding that you that this practice was not okay that it was unfair and prejudicial to other members in the co-op to allow those long-term members to be um, overhoused when there were others that were underhoused and one of the things that the court looked at was the mandate of the co-op, which was to provide sustainable and affordable housing to its members. 
So they were saying basically you couldn't have this policy, whether formal or informal, to allow uh, members to be overhoused when other members were underhoused, because that does not provide sustainable and affordable housing to all your members in doing that. Um, yeah, so that was that was my that was all I had to say about that case. Unless there were yeah questions or comments about. Do you see uh, tenants and other like no, other nonprofits being able to use this case law, even though they're not living in a co-op? But in a nonprofit, um, not the, I mean, unless you're in a co-op, you can't rely on this. But one thing that's, yeah, I mean, there's there's the new, um, the Societies Act has been updated recently to include um, some new provisions that kind of mirror some of this language. But that would be for members as opposed to non-members. So. So you're saying it's yeah. kind of restricted in terms of like practical use is restricted to other co-ops. This case, yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but as a as tenants, tenants would, I mean, they're tenants, so they they would have tenant their tenant rights under the Residential Tenancy Act and the policy guidelines. And I know to the extent that those are, <laughs> you know, that those are accessible and and useful. It's it's a common complaint, and. Uh, by tenants who are desperately in need of housing mm. and need to move into like their family member, you know, have a growing family and then watch as other people in the same building. And so that's why I was wondering if, uh, if it was applicable in any way. That's a good, that's a good point. Cause it is, you're right that that is something that comes up it's in, a huge, uh, like it's a, it's a common complaint. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, good luck, yeah. right? But what I mean is we can advocate, but can we compel? Yeah, I mean, I, there may be, I'm just trying to think kind of creatively about what you could do about that. I mean, I think one thing, there, there may potentially be a human rights complaint in that. I mean, it would have to be facts that would lend itself to, I mean, have to show discrimination based on some kind of ground, maybe family status could be. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, do either of you have thoughts about, about that particular problem of nonprofits kind of, like if this scenario were ha happening in a nonprofit as opposed to a co-op? Yeah? Oh, good. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you can try it. I think if the nonprofit has a similar mandate, then you can at least say that this is, um, persuasive, uh, in short. I should add that in this case, um, the co-op also it was failing to take the overhoused members and put them into smaller units. So I don't think this case says that you should be able to kick those people out if yeah. there's no other unit. There has to be a unit for them to move into that's appropriately sized. They yeah. just were like really slow. Yeah, they were slow. And I think where, where the members who were overhoused were saying no to the smaller units, they were just letting them stay in the bigger ones, which I, yeah, that's silly. Yeah. Thank you. I was just going to say, yeah, I agree with, with Susanna. I think if there's a nonprofit housing provider that has a similar mandate, you could certainly bring this case up um, and it may be persuasive to a court. So, yeah, could be useful. Well, and you two saying that makes me think it could also be useful to maybe raise that with the board, for example, of that nonprofit to say, look, it's the same kind of principles. Like, if this is, you could rely on that organization's mandate, possibly to say, look, if your mandate is to provide housing, like you, you shouldn't be doing this in this unfair way. And I also think that there's, there's stuff in the RTA that you could potentially rely on. I'm just trying to think of, think that through, but maybe you can make a creative, quiet, enjoy. I, I probably have to think about it more, but I think there might be something there. You, you know, if you, if you have a nonprofit housing provider, theoretically they should be compliant also with you know, BC housing or like government um, policies or guidelines around over housing and under housing. You could you could cite that to say you're not you're not acting in compliance with you know what are considered general standards of of how you do this, right? 
Well, I, I think this would be a, a letter probably to the, potentially to the board of directors. Um, yeah, to, and in the hopes that this could be persuasive to the board and saying like, look, you're not even really meeting your own mandate here. And hopefully you would also have some kind of an R RTB claim that you could bring as well. And also you could consider whether there was a human rights aspect to it. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's no other questions or comments on that, I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle. Okay, so I am going to do a bit of a case law update. So most of these cases are BC Supreme Court cases. There's one Court of Appeal case in here. Um, just a reminder, when we're dealing with court cases, court cases are binding on the RTB. Um, our other RTB decisions are not binding, they're persuasive, but court cases are binding on the RTB, so the RTB does have to follow court cases. So the first case I want to discuss, it's a bit of an old case, but I thought we could maybe have a bit of a refresher on the Bauman case because we're going to talk about the Court of Appeal case as well. Um, so I'm sure you're probably all familiar with the Bauman and Artie Investments case. So this was a 2018 case. Um, whenever we're dealing with the run eviction issue, the legal test that is going to be applied is threefold. So whether or not the renovations or repairs require that the unit be vacant for those repairs or renovations to be completed, whether or not the landlord has a good faith intention to renovate or repair the unit, and whether or not the landlord has all the permits and approvals to undertake those permits or repairs. So in regards to uh, vacant possession, in the Bauman case, the court found the following. Court found that the arbitrator failed to consider Ms. Bauman's offer to vacate the rental unit for the duration of the repairs. And I, I should note here that the duration of the repairs were quite lengthy. I think it was months. It was not short-term duration. It was, it was very long. Judge goes on to say that the rationale behind section 49, subsection 6 of the RTA is to ensure landlords can carry out renovations. Terminating a tenancy where the tenant is agreeable to vacating for the duration of the renovations is inconsistent with this rationale. We were pretty happy with this, <laughs> with this decision and this idea that an RTB arbitrator should consider whether or not a tenant is offering to vacate for the duration of the renovations or repairs because that would be very good for our clients who are tenants. Um, so that was pretty exciting when, when we got this decision and, and we saw that conclusion in regards to the vacant requirement. In terms of the good faith requirement, uh, court found that the arbitrator fell into error and neglected to properly apply the burden of proof on the landlord to establish good, f good faith, excuse me. So the, um, the arbitrator in this case basically put it on the tenant to establish that the landlord was not acting in good faith when we know the onus is on the landlord. So the court did find that the RTB arbitrator did shift the onus and reverse it. And the court also found that the evidence and context was more than sufficient to raise the issue of good faith. The arbitrator failed to properly come to terms with the requirement to address the issue of good faith. There was a transcript that uh, for those of you who've read the decision, that basically had um, a landlord's representative. It's unclear what this person's role was, but this person definitely seemed to be making a representation on behalf of the landlord. And there was a transcript of this conversation between this representative of the landlord and the tenants. And it's very clear in the transcript that this uh, representative was almost trying to bully tenants into just agreeing to move out. Um, I think some buyouts were offered, but it was very clear in the transcript that there was evidence that the landlord might be acting in bad faith. So the judge in this case said that was, that was enough. That was enough to raise the issue of whether or not there was an ulterior motive. So, um, and then went on to determine that because that ulterior motive issue was raised, looked at how the arbitrator dealt with the good faith requirement and found that the burden did shift. In regards to permits, the court found that the landlord did not have all the necessary permits for the work to be carried out. And they, requir and, and they went on to say that the requirement for all necessary permits is not satisfied by obtaining some of the necessary permits. Some of, I believe it was the electrical permit wasn't complete. Uh, the electrician in the hearing even said it's not, it needs an update. So it wasn't a, a fully completed permit. And so the judge here found that 
that does not mean you have the permit if you only have part of the permit or it's incomplete. So generally pretty good decision. I think most people were happy when they saw this decision. Um, unfortunately, that changed a bit <laughs> because then we have the Court of Appeal case that came down recently. And I should note that the RTB was very quick to entrench this decision in policy which was interesting because they then had to go back and fix, I'm not sure what exactly they entrenched in the decision, but I do know there were some things in the BC, court of a, BC Supreme Court level that they then put into policy. And just a note to uh, policy makers everywhere, just wait before <laughs> you entrench case law into your policies. Because of course the landlord was dissatisfied with that decision and appealed. So, case goes on to the Court of Appeal, and the panel, the BC Court of Appeal panel, unfortunately disagreed with the Chamber's judge on the vacant possession issue. The panel found that neither precedent nor common sense required the arbitrator to expressly deal with the evidence that the tenant in this case was willing to find alternate accommodations for the duration of the work. So, I mean, this was a disappointment. Um, this kind of overturned what the court, the BC Supreme Court judge found. Um, although it, it, it remains to be seen whether or not, you know, as Susanna pointed out earlier, what is the duration? Because Barry and Cloet is the case that uh, dealt with the issue of vacant possession initially, and Barry and Cloet talks about when tenants are offering to vacate. And in Barry and Cloet, I believe that was a very short term situation where the repairs and renovations were going to be done and I don't even know that it was a couple, couple days. days. It was very short term. So in that case, the judge did find that yes, you do need to consider the offer to move when it's such a short term duration. But of course, what, what seems to turn in the Bauman case is, is duration really. The, um, judge, the panel ultimately found that, you know, it doesn't make sense that you know, any tenant can offer to vacate for any duration and then be able to come back. And I think part of that might also have something to do with at that time, the right of first refusal was also um, being introduced. So one of the arguments that the Landlord's Council has was that it, it actually would conflict with the right of first refusal because if any tenant can say, hey, I'm going to move out and move back in when it's done, then that sort of allows the situation for landlords to return after renovations at the same rent, which is what we know landlords don't want and what they've been lobbying for and what the right of first refusal um, kind of allows landlords to do to start a new tenancy. So I think that was part of it. Of course, judges aren't supposed to act politically, but that was part of, of the argument brought forward by the landlord. And you do wonder how much that also may have been influential to the panel. Whoops. Okay, the good faith requirement. So generally the panel was in agreement with the chamber's judge in regards to the good faith requirement and the permits as well. Panel agreed with the chamber's judge that while the arbitrator found that the landlord truly intended to do the renovations described in the evidence, he did not expressly, expressly address the tenant's evidence of an ulterior motive. That was largely ignored and the arbitrator had erroneously required the tenant to provide the landlord acted in bad faith. Again, we know the onus is not on the tenant, on the landlord. So panel did agree with the chamber's judge on that and similarly agreed with the chamber's judge on permits and found that the landlord had the permits and approvals acquired by law to do some but not all of the work it contemplated. Panel went on to say that an arbitrator cannot waive or ignore the statutory requirement by issuing an order of possession if the landlord is not authorized and permitted to conduct work that will necessitate obtaining vacant possession at the time they issue the notice to end tenancy, which is also very important. Those permits have to be in place before the landlord even issues the notice to end tenancy. Okay, so that's Bauman. Bit of, bit of a disappointing decision because I think what I mean, we got some, some good stuff in regards to permits and, and good faith, but I think everyone was really upset to lose that vacant possession gain from the chamber's judge decision. Okay, the next case I want to talk about is MBB and Affordable Housing Charitable Society. So this is a case where the tenant was not able to attend the hearing. And this was due to both a language barrier as well as some medication that the tenant had taken prior to the hearing. Um, so 
the original decision as well as the RTB review consideration decision were both judicially reviewed. In terms of the review division decision, the um, the arbitrator in that decision, what basically, sorry, just to give you a bit more of, of the facts here. So the tenant, because of the language barrier and because of the medication, she didn't call into the hearing. She thought that the hearing would call her. She thought she would get a phone call and then she would, and this is not uncommon. Um, I don't know how, how any, of, any of you, how much you encounter this, but I find oftentimes tenants will think that they're expecting a call rather than thinking they're going to be making the call. So this was one of those cases. Um, and then on the review, in the review decision, the arbitrator basically said, well, if you, if you knew you didn't understand the instructions of the hearing itself, the hearing instructions, you should have sought clarification. You should have called the RTB. You should have found out what you needed to do. Um, but on review, Tenant argued in this case that there's a difference between misunderstanding and um, and not knowing what to do because she thought she knew what she needed to do. So seeking clarification would have been pointless. She she was as far as she knew, she had to wait for this hearing to to commence. They were going to call her, so she, it wasn't an issue of her not knowing what to do. She just misunderstood what she needed to do. And so uh, the court did find that the arbitrator's assertion that MBB should have sought clarification in advance of the hearing was not the answer. MBB did not assert she was confused, rather she thought she knew what to do. So it was unreasonable for the arbitrator to have this expectation that she should have sought clarification on the instructions because it wasn't, it wasn't an issue of confusing the instructions, it was misunderstanding them and, and there is that difference. So in terms of the original decision, um, this was the decision that just dealt with the arbitrators uh, finding that the tenant did not attend the hearing and used that as a basis to grant the landlord an order of possession. So I'm sure we've all seen this situation. Tenant doesn't call in. Arbitrator says they're going to leave the line open for 10 minutes. No one calls in. Arbitrator's issuing a decision that same day. Usually that decision says something like, oh, you didn't attend the hearing, so I'm going to grant the order of possession to the landlord. That's wrong. They can't do that. And this case says that. So MBB uh, basically dealt with Rule 7.3 of the RTB Rules of Procedure. So these rules empower an arbitrator to dismiss an application when a party failed to attend the hearing. But the arbitrator still has to make a finding whether or not the statutory criteria for an eviction, and I, sorry, I didn't mention that this was an eviction, that the statutory criteria of an eviction is met and that the landlord had met their burden to prove that those criteria were met. Um, court said that Rule 7.3 of the RTB Rules of Procedure does not empower an arbitrator to dismiss an application to cancel a notice to end tenancy without considering whether the statutory criteria to end the tenancy have been met. It is insufficient to dismiss the application solely on the grounds that an applicant did not attend the hearing. So arbitrators have to make the finding. They can conduct the hearing without the tenant or without whatever party, but they have to make a finding, especially in the instance of notices to end tenancy, they have to make that finding as to whether or not the landlord met their burden of proving that they, they had met the statutory criteria to end the, the tenancy. Now the RTB tells us that they are aware of judicial review decisions and that they do make them available and go over them with their arbitrators but I can tell you since this decision I have certainly seen more decisions from the RTB that are dismissing tenants applications to cancel notices um, just on the basis that the person did not attend. Failing to undertake an analysis to determine whether or not the statutory criteria ha has been met. So this continues to happen. Um, but we do have this case, so it's not, uh, it's not fatal to a tenant if they don't attend the hearing because the arbitrators are still making these bad decisions where they're just dismissing it on that basis that they didn't attend. So then, oh, keep getting behind here. Okay, so this case, Schuld and New, and this is a case involving tenants' compensation. So in this case, the landlord gave uh, a notice to end tenancy to move in a close family member into the unit. 
But what they ultimately did was demolish the unit. So they never moved in a close family member. They got the tenant out on that basis that they were moving in a, a close family member, but then ultimately decided they were going to demolish the unit anyways. So the tenant goes back with an application uh, to, to receive tenant's compensation. And so the court found um, that the arbitrator chose to expand the definition of the word occupy in section 49, subsection 3 of the RTA, which is the close member close family member moving in provision, so that it encompassed section 49.6 of the Residential Tenancy Act, and that's the demolition provision. This deter interpretation is not in the proper legal context. So the arbitrator basically said, occupy doesn't mean reside. Occupy doesn't say you have to live there, so it's fine that you demolish the unit. You, you, it was fine, you, you were able to do that. Tenant, you're not entitled to tenant's compensation because ultimately, they did what they said they were going to do. Occupy does not require them to move in. So this case actually says that uh, Occupy does actually mean reside. And this case has also been entrenched in policy guideline 2A, which is the ending of tenancy for occupancy by landlord, purchaser, or close family member. And it says in the policy itself, um, references this decision and says that and says that this case stands for the proposition that occupy means reside. So this can this policy guideline this decision can be used anytime you're needing to argue whether or not occupy means reside or not because now we have clarification that it does in fact mean reside. So this case, this is a case, uh, Suri and Vara, and this deals with uh, the use of an interpreter. And so it's always a bit tricky when parties have interpreters that are family members. They may not have the best proficiency in that language, but it's the best a party could do because interpretation services are expensive. The RTB doesn't provide that service. So some folks, all they have is family members to rely on. Um, and this case dealt with that. It was, uh, it was a case where the landlord's testimony was interpreted by his son-in-law. And during the hearing, the tenant raised the issue of bias and that the interpretation was inaccurate. So the tenant argued that the, the tenant also had um, spoke the language that the landlord spoke, so they were able to testify to the interpretation not being accurate, and also could tell the arbitrator the level of proficiency of the son-in-law is, is not very high. Um, and so they raised that during the hearing. Now the court found that there's, and this was a procedural fairness issue. This is what this was argued as. And so the court found that no breach of procedural fairness in a decision of the arbitrator to permit the, to permit the interpreter to assist the landlord at the hearing in order to make their presentation. So it's fine to get family members. It's fine to have people come and assist with interpretation. There's no requirement that an assistant chosen by the landlord uh, needs to fulfill a specific function or be at arm's length or that they even have a high level of proficiency in both languages. So interpreter doesn't have to have high proficiency and they don't have to be at arm's length of the, uh, of the person they're interpreting for. But the judge did say that a denial of procedural fairness occurs where the interpreter's role crossed over to interpreting the landlord's testimony to the arbitrator. So what the interpreter was doing in this situation was not translating, was interpreting. And you have to be concerned about that when there is that connection where there might be bias. Now you have someone that's interpreting, but not only translating, but interpreting in a way that they think is going to be beneficial to the person they're interpreting for. So when that happens, that's a procedural fairness issue. Um, and so the court said specifically, so limited proficiency in Punjabi coupled with his personal relationship to the landlord raises a real question as to whether the evidence upon which the arbitrator relied in making his decision that the landlord acted in good faith was an accurate interpretation of the landlord's evidence. And that was the other thing. It was about credibility. It was about whether or not the landlord was acting in good faith. So this was the type of case where, you know, particular attention needs to be paid to what's being translated who's doing the translation. So if ever you're in a situation where there is an interpreter providing interpretation services to a landlord, this is something that you can challenge in, in the hearing. Um, and it's something that you would probably need to challenge at that level for it to be able to move on to judicial review because you can't raise an issue on judicial review that's not raised in the decision or not part of the record before the RTB. So that's why it's important to just raise these things then if they're popping into your head raise them because 
Again, if they're not raised at that point, you can't raise them later on judicial review. So the last case I'm going to talk about is, oh, I keep getting behind, my apologies, um, is a case called Marshall and Pohl, and this is a 2019 BC Supreme Court case, and this deals with adequacy of reasons. And prior to Marshall and Pohl, there was a really great decision that Amber was actually co-counsel on. It's called Lavender and First United. Um, this is a really important case because prior to Lavender, adequacy of reasons was not at all ever considered a ground for judicial review. It's still not technically a ground of judicial review, but judges wouldn't even touch it. They would not go into the realm of the reasons of the arbitrator inadequate or slim, and I'm sure we've all seen our fair share of really bad decisions that don't actually give reasons or state what the evidence they're relying on is. Um, so Lavender helps to kind of swing that pendulum back to judges starting to consider this issue of reasons issued by the RTB. And so Marshall and Pohl is a more recent decision because Lavender was 2015. Yeah, so Lavender is, is a few years old now, but Marshall and Pohl just uh, is recent and it it is the judge in that case did consider inadequacy of reasons there. So I think that's a good sign that we're still like on that upswing towards adequacy of reasons being considered by judges on judicial review. So in this case, this, um, this was a case where the tenant was given a one month notice for cause for significantly disturbing other tenants. Now the types of incidents described were things like, oh, he doesn't hold the door for me, or um, you know, he didn't say hello to me. So whether or not that rises to the level of significant, that was for the arbitrator to decide. Nonetheless, uh, this case was successful because um, the court did find that the reasons were not adequate. And specifically, the court said that the arbitrator summarized the evidence and submissions of the parties, but makes no findings of facts about which incidents actually occurred beyond the general statement that there were multiple incidents. So the arbitrator doesn't spe specify this incident or that incident, just there were multiple incidents. The arbitrator does not address the petitioner's explanation and denial of some of the complaints or explain why the evidence of the landlord was apparently preferred. That's another thing. If an if a arbitrator is preferring a landlord's evidence to a tenant's evidence, they have to explain why. You have to know why someone else's evidence is preferred to yours. So that's part of the adequacy of reasons test. And uh, the judge also went on to say that the arbitrator does not explain which incidents, either individually or cumulatively, met the statutory standard of significant interference or an unreasonable disturbance. So that's what the case won on. Um, the issue of whether or not the incidents rose to the level of significant was not considered. That goes to weight, and weight is not considered by judges on judicial review. So adequacy of reasons won the day. So good, good sign. Thanks to Lavender, we can continue to make these arguments on judicial review, and Marshall and Pohl is the most recent example of that. So that's it for case law updates. Are there any further questions? I think we got about five more minutes. Like, would you have to raise during the hearing that you feel the arbitrator is um, accepting the landlord's evidence more? And is that something then you could take to the judicial review? Because we do have like uh, a landlord that has a couple of buildings and we've had uh, tenancy hearings where they've seemed to use the same evidence against multiple tenants, mm -hmm. uh, but the arbitrator does seem to err on the side of the landlord. So. I'm just wondering, could you clarify how you could use this um, argument to get to the judicial review stage? Right, so the inadequacy of reasons argument is more about not so much what happens or what's raised in, in the hearing. This is more just focused on the decision itself. So if in the decision it doesn't, it'll just say, like I prefer the landlord's testimony and that's it then you're probably looking at a potential issue of inadequacy of reasons. Um, I mean, certainly I'm thinking about when you're in the hearing, at that point you don't know what the reasons are gonna be. So you can't really, there's not much I think you can really do at that stage. The best thing is always just raise every argument, every instance where you think the arbitrator might be biased because then you can have that addressed. So if you felt that there was a bias there, um, for the landlord. Bias is very difficult to prove, but 
you would want to raise that there is maybe some bias at that stage uh, for it to be considered on judicial review. But basically, inadequacy reasons, again, not much you can do in the hearing itself because it's all about the reasons. And we don't know what the reasons are going to be during the hearing. So it's really just applicable to, to after you get that decision. I don't know, anyone else, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that scenario lends itself to, like, to being, to scrutinizing the reasons carefully, I think, because it sounds like in that scenario, it might be the landlord's just recycling old information and, like, old arguments, and the arbitrator has, has to grapple with the evidence that's before them, and they have to explain why they've preferred that evidence, so it seems like a red flag in this scenario if it's kind of like this pattern that you're seeing, so it's probably worth raising with uh, someone like Danielle at class, <laughs> if you're seeing that. And, and then you could, I'm assuming you would assess the reasons to see if the, if the RTB has adequately explained why they've preferred yeah. the landlord's evidence in that case. Yeah. yeah. We, oh, sorry. For most of us who do this work, we know that there's just an inherent bias, and, and our, the RTB tends to most often go in favor of landlords. I mean, the act itself is not fair towards tenants, and, and the RTB and their decision making doesn't appear to be fair towards tenants and seems to have a preference for landlord's evidence. Not uncommon to see these decisions where it just says, I prefer the landlord's evidence, but we have no idea why. Why are you preferring the landlord's evidence to the tenants right now when they're conflicting? Um, so, yeah. It does go to credibility, absolutely. Um, because if you, again, if there's a conflict, especially when there's a conflict in the evidence, landlord saying one thing, tenant saying the other, you absolutely, as a decision maker, need to clarify why you're choosing one side over the other. Um, if there's no conflict, if one party is just sort of accepting it and not really fighting it, then you know they should still say why they buy the landlord's evidence. But especially when there's a conflicting testimony, they should absolutely be explaining why they're choosing one over the other, because that lends itself to that inherent bias that you know the decision makers tend to often go in favor of landlords to, to tenants, especially when we're dealing with these subjective type of issues, right? Whether or not something's significant enough to warrant an eviction or, um, that's especially, especially tricky. Any other questions? Okay, maybe I'm confused, but I thought it was the role of the arbitrator to determine credibility. So I have had decisions where you know, in the absence of corroborating evidence on either side, and one party says one and the other party says the other, I know the onus should be on, well, an eviction, I'm talking, these are the, invariably the, the, the situations, should, the onus should be on the landlord. But often, like I see the decision and the decision says, I find the landlord's testimony was more credible. And I thought, I actually thought that that was okay, that that was within the purview of the arbitrator. Are you saying it's not? No, it is, credibility is absolutely in the purview of the arbitrator, and a judge won't re-decide who to believe and not to believe. A judge isn't going to make those judgment calls about what the arbitrator found as far as credibility goes. Okay, so yeah, you're distinguishing that from adequacy of reasons. Just explain they have exactly they yeah. So they just have to explain why, like they get to make that finding, but they have to explain why one party is more credible than the other. And if they don't, then we're looking at an adequacy of reason issue. But if they do, we can't challenge that because a judge won't decide who to believe and who not to believe. That's already been done by the decision maker of the first instance, which is the arbitrator. So, yeah. Okay, guess that's it. Thank you all for coming.